If you have your Bibles, please open them to Psalm chapter 73 and verse 17. Psalm verse 17 of chapter 73. I want to use for a title today, it all makes sense in the sanctuary. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. If you back up one verse, you will find where Asaph said it was too painful for me when I thought about this until I went into the sanctuary. Then understood I their end. Let us pray. God, we thank you today because you are great. You are a name that is worthy to be praised. There has never been nor will there ever be a name more powerful or as powerful as yours. Kings, princes, presidents, and powers may at times rise to great heights and wield great influence, and yet you have and you shall overcome them all. And so, God, I pray that today, if there are those in our midst who are caught up in life and none of it really makes a lot of sense to them, I pray that this sermon would begin to steer them to understanding and that they, like Asaph of our psalm, would find that it all makes sense when they find in your presence that truth for which they seek. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It all makes sense in the sanctuary. Psalm 73 was written by Asaph, that good and talented man whom David set as one of the music leaders over the king choirs that sung the praises of Yahweh in the great congregation. This man, Asaph, was more than just a singer. This man was a worshiper. Throughout the Psalms, one will find many delightful and thrilling songs which Asaph himself composed to sing in praises before the great congregation. And just such is the psalm from which we lift the text, Psalm 73. But this man Asaph, though great, talented, and a worshiper of God, was not immune from the common plagues which afflict humanity. I speak of doubt, which creeps into the remote corners of our soul's and conceals itself until the moment when our faith is shaken by some experience or observation. And then doubt throws aside its disguises and begins to besiege the mind with many of its well-prepared questions. Questions which beleaguered and confused souls cannot answer or reconcile. We as humanity like to think that we know something about God when in fact, We know so little concerning him who is high and holy. Asaph records for us in Psalm 73 a personal experience of this nature in which after some observation which he made, he is assaulted by doubt and confusion. I do not believe that this crisis in Asaph's soul rose from any love of the world or an inordinate desire in his heart. No, I believe that this is the case where something happened in this good man's life that was so grievous and painful that it reconfigured his world and left his soul with all questions and no answers. Brothers and sisters, you know the things of which I speak. The spouse comes home and says, I've been laid off. This is the last paycheck for a while. Or the doctor looks you in the eye and says, I'm sorry, but you only have a few months to live. Or the phone rings and someone on the other end says, I'm sorry to inform you, but your loved one was in an accident and they did not make it. These times and many more times like these will cause us to reevaluate our lives. It will cause us to compare our burdens to the burdens of those around us. And when it seems that our faith has not protected us or that our faith has not kept us from trouble, 
Satan springs into action to attempt to make us believe that God has failed us, that his words are empty and his actions delinquent, that God has made a breach of promise as it pertains to us. Something of this nature is what I believe calls Asaph to begin comparing his life to the life of the wicked around him. So let us discover, first of all, what he saw. Asaph, in looking around him, began to consider how the wicked lived their lives, and in doing so, he observed a number of things. Asaph observed that the wicked prosper. You can find this in verse 3. They make good money, they live in great houses, they hold offices, positions of prestige and power. They have many friends. In every way, their life seems to be a successful one. Asaph also observed that the wicked didn't get sick. They were not bedridden till they died. No, it seemed that they were strong and healthy, able to do as they pleased until they took their last breath. He tells us this in verse 4. Disease, declining health, was not the reason for their death. Feebleness did not seize them. Paralysis did not immobilize them. They enjoyed remarkable physical health until the last. Asaph also observed that the wicked did not seem to have as much trouble or emotional turmoil as other men in verse 5. Their livestock did not get sick and die. Their houses did not burn. Their children never broke a bone. And none of them was ever worried about whether or not God was pleased with them. Therefore, when there was little emotional conflict, when they broke one of God's laws or mistreated their neighbor, they never thought about heaven, hell, eternity, morality, wrong, right. It made no difference to them at all. Asaph also observed that the wicked considered boasting like a piece of jewelry that made them more desirable and added value to their lives in verse 6. These wicked people boasted about their wickedness. They liked to show it off as one would show off a nice expensive piece of jewelry and they were all too happy to tell more and more of their shameful stories, reveling in each one and savoring each sort of detail, wearing their sins around their necks like a gold chain. Asaph also observed, that the wicked was well-fed and even overfed, verse 7. They never lacked food or any other thing that they wished. They could and did indulge themselves in every carnal delight they desired. He also observed that the wicked perverted justice and boasted of it, verse 8. One would bribe or blackmail the other. They would conspire together to bring about desired verdicts in civil trials and then boast of their corrupt dealings. He also observed that the wicked blaspheme God and they curse their fellow man. This and other iniquitous behavior was what was observed by Asaph. And as he looked around him, he saw these things happening. And then he was brought home to the painful things in his life that was happening to him, even though he was trying to live right. These observations causes Asaph to begin to wonder. Why does a God who instructs his people to live holy lives and promises to curse and destroy the wicked allow these present day evildoers to live so well? Asaph is experiencing a difficulty in reconciling his faith with the facts. His faith says that God judges the righteous, that God is angry with the wicked every day. But the facts say that the wicked fares as well in a lot of ways better than the righteous at the present time. Oh, how confusing and alarming it can be when faith and facts are seemingly irreconcilable. Now that we know what Asaph saw, let us consider how he saw it. Asaph did not see things as they really were. We hardly ever do. Anyone's life that is observed without inside knowledge is only an illusion. For instance, the homeless person punches no clocks, pays no taxes, cleans no house, mows no lawn, and yet we fail to see the nights that they spend shivering in the cold, soaking in the rain, hungrily digging through the garbage can in search of food, we fail to see the times they're afraid because there is no walls to provide them protection. 
The wealthy in their big houses, with their luxury cars, their manicured lawns, their lucrative investments, seem to have life at the beck and call, and yet we do not see the fear of failure that hangs over their heads like the sword of Damocles. We are not privy to their lawsuits and worries, their foes and parasitic friendships which take their toll upon their bodies and prevents peace in their minds. Many a rich person would gladly trade some of their wealth and possession for a little peace of mind. Many celebrities would trade the bulk of their fame and popularity for a little solitude and privacy. Many a homeless person would trade their unbridled freedom and duty-free lifestyle for a little security and stability. Asaph saw the facts that he observed as a rebuttal of his faith. For if God is who he proclaims he is and demands what he says he does, then how is it that the wicked are without distress while the righteous is bent low in trouble? In verses 12 through 14 of Psalm 73, Asaph gives us his honest feelings concerning this whole scenario. He writes, Behold, These are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. This good and godly man has temporarily lost his way. He is experiencing doubt in gigantic proportions and it's affecting him in a negative way. This he confesses in verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 73. Saying, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I was unsteady, says Asaph. Had nothing solid to stand on, my faith had been shaken and doubt had assaulted my mind. He confesses, I had become envious of the foolish and coveted the prosperity of the wicked. Do you see how a confused state quickly transforms this good and godly man into a mental apostate? One who has become unsteady and envious, wanting to exchange his eternal security for a seasonal, fleeting, momentary apparition of carnal gratification. Asaph confesses, I wanted the lifestyle of the wicked. I wanted their riches, their possessions. I wanted to live without restraint and be the master of my own world, architect of my own empire. I wanted to gratify the flesh and enjoy the pleasures of the godless lifestyle. And to complicate matters, Asaph is a worship leader. Regularly, perhaps weekly, maybe even daily, he is required to stand and praise a God who he does not understand and whose words at this point are seemingly hollow and empty. Have you ever tried to praise God when you were in just such a state of mind as Asaph was? Have you ever tried to lead others in singing praises when your mind is in turmoil and confusion reigns in your soul? Have you ever tried to preach when you did not understand why things were as they were and yet it were your responsibility to lead others into an intimate relationship and experience with a God that you yourself could not understand? If you haven't yet had such a time in your life, just keep living For I believe that just such a time as this occurs in every believer's life at some point. Asaph is in such a place at the moment. He never quit singing. He never stopped leading worship or presenting himself before God and his people. But on the inside, there was confusion, doubt, even apostasy because his faith and the facts did not agree. Asaph is singing praises that he cannot feel observing and affirming promises that he cannot grasp, speaking out assurances that he himself wishes he could embrace. It's all so confusing that he cannot apply himself to what 
he regularly affirms to others, oh, this is a slippery place for the believer. It is a treacherous piece of ground over which every believer at points in their lives must pass. I could spend time in the sermon showing you where Asaph's faith was skewed. I could show you how Asaph believed that God had promised to do something that in fact he had not. I could analyze Asaph's life and point out all the positive blessings and effects which his devotion to God had secured to him and his family. But these would be vain and ineffective words at this moment to Asaph. One reason Asaph did not understand was the difference between his lifestyle and the lifestyle of the wicked and the seemingly outcome of it all. One cannot reason Asaph through this crisis of faith. We cannot argue him out of his true feelings. We cannot spin the facts in a favorable light, nor we may alleviate his confusion with our carnal wisdom. In these moments, the last thing that anyone wants to hear in this situation is a theological discourse on faith and the sovereignty of God drawn out by a well-meaning but idealistic friend who cannot empathize with you in the moment. In these moments, we do not so much need to know what the Scripture says but what it means. We know what it says. But how does it relate to the facts of my present experience? Oh, but God be praised. That duty required Asaph to present himself regularly at the place of worship. For he writes, Psalm 73, 16 and 17. When I thought to know this, It was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God and I understood their end. I did not understand, he says. Life made no sense. My faith and the facts were irreconcilable until I went into the sanctuary. Asaph said, I went to the place of worship out of duty, not desire. Yet when I stepped inside and began to access the presence of the Lord God, which dwells between the cherubim, my confusion began to clear. My frustration melted away. My faith awoke and resurged. Everything took on a new light and a new clarity for me that day. It all made sense in the sanctuary. Believer, never absent yourself from the place where God can be felt and the Scripture heard. Never stay home because you are burdened, discouraged, depressed, or even put out over what is or is not happening in your life because I'm here to tell you some things will never make sense to you except when you are in the sanctuary. Now, I do not mean to say that this physical room in which we sit is in some way a portal I do not mean to say that this room is a special place that clears away all frustration. Really, this is only an outer court to the true sanctuary of the soul where God's presence resides. But it is in this room where we prepare our hearts to enter in or to be drawn into the inner sanctum, the holy of holies where the light of divine revelation and the miracle of mercy is performed on the mercy seat. This is the place where mortality is touched and overshadowed by divinity, the place where God becomes more than a concept and actually becomes a companion, a place where it is written in Psalm 41 and 3, The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou will make all his bed in his sickness. Oh, what a concept. What a concept concerning the divine tenderness of the Almighty. To think that God is all powerful, yet he will tenderly engage the strength that can rend mountains to restore the vitality of one exhausted mortal. To think that God, who made the heavens, now promises to make a sickbed for a suffering man. What willing and tender condescension. When God is in the room, everything takes on a different meaning. If God is in the room, the languishing then even makes 
them to feel joy unspeakable and full of glory. If God is in the room, the sick bed becomes a couch upon which we may repose in his presence. When God is in the room, little dead girls come back to life. When God is in the room, withered limbs are restored. When God is in the room, men that doubt like Thomas are filled with faith and cry out, my Lord and my God. When God is in the room, lame men leap, dumb men speak, deaf men hear, sins are forgiven and demons are cast out. Everything changes when God is in the room. And if he promises to make my bed in all of my sickness, he has committed himself to remain and nurse me through the duration of this crisis. No promise can be sweeter or more comforting than this. We know now what Asaph saw. We know how he saw it. And now using Asaph's own words, I want to show you how it really is. Asaph wrote in verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 73, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. When I finally got God in the room, when I entered the place where doubt could not remain, when I found the place of sanctuary from my ever-present carnality, then I understood their end. He writes in verse 18, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down into destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, the wicked live in peril. They live in imminent peril and eternal peril. They live in imminent peril because God has so ordained that all who live wickedly shall do so in slippery places. This means that their actions, their attitudes, their words, their choices are all conducive to disaster and ruin. The circles in which they run and the company they keep are also living in a way that is conducive to disaster. The very environment in which they live and breathe is so charged with negativity of every sort and inundated with volatile material and situations so that any little thing might set off not only one disaster but literally a string of disasters. One drug deal gone bad. One immoral act with the wrong person. One home invasion with, where the owner is home with a gun. One instance of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. One episode of road rage. One drunken brawl. One belligerent, profanity-laden tirade could be the end for them. Each drug high could end in an overdose. They are traversing and living their lives in slippery places. They might manage to stay upright for weeks, months, even years. But as Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 32 and 35... Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Sooner rather than later, their sins and bad choices will catch up to them, and they will perish. Not only will they perish physically, but eternally as well. So then begrudge not the wicked and the unbelieving their little pleasures and prosperity in this life. Rather, look on them with pity. For as we know, they only have this life to enjoy since they make no preparation for the world to come. But brothers and sisters, with us it is not so. We take a different path. And while I will agree that our way is filled with sorrow and woe, while heartache besets and Satan attacks, our way is not a slippery one. The road upon which we walk is not unsteady. It is not apt to give way. Many souls have traversed it before us and their line of direction was so straight, so steady and unerring that we marvel at it still. Yes, they might have stumbled like Asap, but it was not because the ground was slippery. Rather, it was their carelessness and their mortality that occasioned it. I think of Job, that good and upright man who traveled the rough path of immortality. 
Yet he was, it was not a slippery one. His feet remained firm. His direction was always forward. Unvarying was his faith and determination. This reminds me of the words of David from Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Watch this. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. With the wicked it is not so. Satan holds the hands of the ungodly. Therefore, it is certain that when they slip, they must be pulled downward. But with the righteous whose hand is held by the Lord, even when we stumble, his love and his strength holds us up. Dear soul yet unsaved, to you I would speak a word of prophecy straight from Scripture. You are in slippery places. It is only a matter of time before all conditions conspire against you and your foot will slide. And when it does, you will fall. You will fall into greater sin. You will fall into greater perdition. You will fall into divorce. You will fall into poverty. You might even fall into prison. You will eventually or suddenly, as God wills, fall into the grave in hell and finally into the lake of fire, for there is no one to hold you up. The hand of Christ you have not taken, though it has been stretched out to you time and time again and remains stretched out still. If you persist, if you rebel, if you continue in your evil ways, then know this. The ground which you traverse is treacherously slippery and unstable. And sooner rather than later, your feet will slide. Then comes the end. Then comes the judgment. Then comes eternity, that time for which you are not prepared. Oh, turn to Christ. Take his hand that hand which he so lovingly offers to all. Hear the promise of Romans 10, 9 through 11. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh, believe it. Embrace it. Receive Christ. Allow him to set your feet firm on holy ground. And may you do so before it is too late. Christian friend, if you are disillusioned or confused, if the facts around you does not agree with the faith within you, if you cannot understand life and its trouble, let me tell you where to go. Enter into the sacred presence of God. Shut yourself in with him. Make a sacred space for communion with your Savior. For when you do, you will find that it all makes sense in the sanctuary.